Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm joined here today by my friend and colleague, Daniel, from Film Radar. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, in case you didn't know, Daniel also made uh, a video about Game of Thrones and basically criticizing uh, the third episode, The Battle of Winterfell. And so we felt this was a good opportunity, now that we've both seen the latest episode, episode uh, five, to sort of discuss our thoughts on it. And we've been getting a ton of comments on just giving our update, asking to, to give our updated thoughts. So I think this is a good opportunity to sort of discuss and, and have an interesting discussion about it without it being a video essay. Uh, so enjoy. What I thought was interesting is that we both made videos uh, on Game of Thrones and about this season. And I, I watched your video, and I think the main takeaway or the crux of your uh, of your argument was that it's basically as if uh, Dan and Dave are giving us the cliff notes uh, of the show. Of like, that season eight is basically just the cliff notes of of uh, the climax of the show. And it's all about having moments instead of nurturing, uh, nourishing a larger narrative. And it's basically what I said in my narrative, uh, in my video, which is that it's almost as if they're writing the show for you know the drunken audience at a bar, where it's all about getting those those little moments of shock, surprise, without really any build up setup, just to have that complete surprise, but thereby also sacrificing the larger narrative just to get that sort of short term shock. And, but then when you go back to it, it doesn't make any sense. And it sort of just completely uh, internally destroys the story as a whole. And I think with this latest episode, episode five, uh, the bells, I think it's called, uh, yep. they, it just shows that they're really adhering to the God of subversion at, at all costs, like regardless yeah. of, of narrative consistency or, or whatnot. Uh, so yeah, and I'll let you sort of segue us into into the episode, and we'll take it from there. Sure. So I uh, I definitely felt very disappointed after watching The Long Night, which was episode three, and kind of felt like you know there's really no way this is going to possibly get any worse than this. They already just like deflated the biggest conflict that the show has ever had building, and so I had already set my expectations very very low and I was still <laughs> further disappointed I thought this was easily the worst episode that the show's ever produced I mean on a technical level it's great just like The Long Night it has a lot yeah. going for it cinematically but narratively I think they betrayed just about every character's arc that they've been building towards and not in a way that's just like oh I'm not happy because it's not what I expected but it's genuinely betraying the character's integrity and just goes against everything we've learned about these characters over the last seven seasons. Right. Yeah. And it's again, and it's, it's, I think it's objectively bad at this point. It's, I, yeah, uh, I agree. From a storytelling uh, perspective uh, and at least in, in, in the rules that, and then the stories that they've set up, I think it's just very um, dishonest or. Which isn't to say, cause I feel like there are a lot of people who get defensive who are enjoying it. And I just want to add the caveat that if you're enjoying it, I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong or right. stupid. Uh, I wish I was enjoying it, but I do think that if we're being honest about the story they've been setting up, it is just objectively going against what they were building. Right. I think you can, I think it's, it's you know, again, I, I agree with you. I think it's 100% fine to enjoy the story. You can enjoy something that, that is, you know, not that good. Uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy Defense of Menace, for instance. I really enjoy that yeah. movie. But I know that objectively speaking, there's like things that definitely could have been better or like they could have sure. done differently and that would have made it, you know, an objectively better movie. But like your subjective experience of something is not the objective re necessarily the, the subjective, the objective reality of, of the right. situation. And so those two <laughs> separate you can like something and it can be bad and, and, and vice versa. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, oh man, <laughs> they, I agree with you completely. I mean, it started mm -hmm. with episode three that they just started that it really started going downhill in terms of narrative consistency. And, and, and it's been going on for a couple of seasons. And I think it's just now that people are really, that's sort of the casual audience as well. is just catching on to it as well, that something isn't quite right. And I think with this episode, mm -hmm. it just really burned things to the ground for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So I think we should focus, as you said, mostly on the storytelling aspects. You know, we can talk about the technical things. And I think a lot of the technical things, you know, the, the cinematography and, and, and the set building and all that sort of stuff is, is still top notch and 
and I, I don't really care. It's not really our channels, and and that's for for other people to discuss. But the storytelling is mm-hmm. is uh, the crux of what we're trying to get to here. Right. Well, so to start with, uh, you know, the beginning of the episode kind of follows Varus as he's just in his last ditch effort to try and get people on his side to see that John is the best choice uh, for, you know, ruling the seven kingdoms. And so we see him, you know, trying to talk to John and trying to have his like last little chance at subverting this new queen. And I thought the way that that was handled was just very, very poor in (laughs) keeping with his character. Because if you think back to season one, uh, he was, he came down to the cell when Ned was held prisoner before he was executed. And he had this whole spiel basically saying like, you know, it's okay to lie. It's okay to sacrifice a little bit of dignity to stay alive. You know, yeah, like yeah. you have to be in this for the long haul because ultimately we're here to protect the people. We're here to protect the realm. This has nothing to do with pride or honor. This has nothing to do with our houses. You know, Varys doesn't have a house, you know, he doesn't have a family name. He's in it to protect the realm, to protect the people. And what we've seen time and again throughout this series history for Varys is that he will survive at all costs and he will outsmart his enemies at every turn. He's been consistently one of the smartest characters, one of the best strategical thinkers, and he gets out of these dangerous situations and he yeah. always knows who to bet on and when and so I just, I felt that it was very poorly done that he just kind of rolls over and accepts his fate um, without I, really any sort of fight. I mean, it, it's also just like, it's, he's very blatant and he's not really like being sneaky about it. He's trying to, so I think right. you're implying that he's trying to poison her. I don't know if that's, that's true, but like he has that little girl come in and he's talking mm-hmm. about, she's talking about like she's not eating and then he's like, oh, we'll, we'll try again later. When, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so I think that she's implying that they're trying to poison her. That's what I think. Uh, yeah. So, but he's not being very careful about things. He's just like, it's almost like they, they're doing the same thing. They did the same thing to him, what they did to Littlefinger. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people uh, thought, that, oh no, he's going to come back. You know, he's the smart. They're like the two smartest guys or like the, the best, well, maybe not the smartest guys, but the, the best players of the game. Right. And so you, you would think they'd have a little more, they pack more of a punch before they go out. And, and that's, and I agree with you. And then I think we, that's how we get back to, you know, the main points of, of our videos that they, uh, not necessarily about having a shock surprise for him because it wasn't necessarily a, a shock or anything, but it definitely was, uh, you know, it felt like a little cliff note. It was very rushed, you know, it could have been, yeah. could have been interesting. So I, I could see it sort of going down some, uh, his end being something like this in the books, maybe. Totally. Uh, but, but again, it's like he had one episode, last episode he saw Danny being unhappy at, the the meal at Winterfell and he was like yo this bitch is crazy <laughs> and yeah. so yeah, I guess I'll kill her you know like, yeah there hasn't been like and and I've argued in my video that 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 uh, my my first video that I made that Danny is being set up as a sort of tyrannical queen and a lot of people were like no you're just you know you're being sexist or your 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 opinion is skewed and she's not that bad I'm like it doesn't right. doesn't matter I'm telling you like it, I'm not telling you logically I'm telling you what the show is right. Showing. Like what, how they're setting up, especially in season seven when they were burning the Tarleys. Mm-hmm. And then they, 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 they brought that even further when they brought Sam in. And Sam is like, oh, you burned my family and all that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking, like, we can discuss whether that was the right thing to do or not. Like it doesn't, it's irrelevant. They were setting her up to be, to become this tyrannical person. But then, well, sure. It's certainly I, like if we're comparing to John, I mean, you know, there's never a moment where John takes pleasure in killing. Yeah. Uh, or when he kills unnecessarily, like the closest thing you could say to that would be when he executes um, uh, the, I'm forgetting all of their names now, but uh, the Night's Watch who betrayed him, Yeah, you know, but like we have already kind of established that that's the way this world works. Um, Like one of the first scenes in the show was Ned beheading the deserter of the Night's Watch because that's just how it goes. Yeah. Um, and so it, that I think is fair. Yeah, yeah. And the difference is that that um, the difference is that, that that she seems to, or like at least they show us that she seems to sort of take enjoyment out of the the, the misery and the death of of the people she kills. And whereas John, as you said, it's like he does it because you know that's just sort of like how the world works. But he's not he's not passionate about it. After he kills the people from the Night's Watch, he 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 quits being a commander. He's like fuck us up. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to. 
he he isn't like happy about it or anything. Um, so I think that was the difference. Like, and you can talk about who's who's right and wrong. It doesn't matter. It's like how they're how they're setting. No, it totally, up. totally. And if and, we're talking about like pure archetypes, which are being obeyed to a certain degree on the show and always have been, yeah, like it's very clear that you know it's kind of been the conversation for a while now of who would be the better leader, John or Danny. Yeah, basically since like season three, season four. I mean, that's been the conversation. Um, and so, I mean, it's without saying that John has been clearly the stronger candidate for a, a long time now. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I, it, it's, it, that's right. You know, I made the whole video. I'm like, this is so, he's so clearly in that archetype. And, yeah. and that's why I also thought that what sort of things would go down slightly differently, oh, even though they actually, now that this episode has passed, like they actually didn't really deviate too much from 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 the arcs definitely not with danny they just the problem with, with danny is and we can talk about that now i think the biggest yeah. one of the biggest i think problems with this episode uh is that obviously uh we last episode like the, the last couple of episodes are all just sort of meant to 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 uh make her devolve or like show that sort of devolvement into into her becoming the mad queen but it's it's you know it's there's just not enough time to do it and so when we finally see her uh, you know, roast people alive for like 30 minutes. It's like, it feels very strange because it's like, I, I thought that she was going to be a tyrannical queen. Like I said in my video, but this was like, it felt so, this like, it felt like they could have put two seasons into this, to this development and it should have yeah. had that to make it seem like, okay, this makes sense. Um, so I saw something on Twitter that I thought was a really apt point, which was comparing uh, to Breaking Bad, which, you know, for a while, like everyone is just kind of, considered to be one of the greatest series of all time. Don't worry, I'm not gonna like spoil anything, but obviously for anyone who vaguely knows the story of Breaking Bad, it follows Walter White as he goes from being like high school chemistry teacher to drug kingpin. And uh, someone made the point though, that when you go back and watch that show, you can see the seeds of him becoming less than the good guy from the very first episode it's always there and like they continue to funnel that through each episode through each season as we see him get more and more corrupt more and more selfish mm -hmm. ego driven vengeance driven all of it um but the problem with danny and this arc is we spend you know six seasons just really following her doing the right thing she does take pleasure in killing people but they're always people who uh, at least from most of our perspectives, deserve it. You know, they're slave owners, they're rapists, they're murderers. Uh, like I saw someone, you know, made like this meme thing of like, here are all of the horrible things she's done. And now like people are freaking out that she's continued to do more horrible things. But it's like, from the beginning, like she took pleasure in seeing her brother die, but her brother was just using her, sold her like a brood mare for his army, beat her, tortured her, degraded her, was just an all around, piece of trash to her and so you know of course she like she her taking pleasure in that is not the same as you know just being evil right like the i i thought about this earlier but it's like when we watch Django Unchained, do we think of Django as the villain just because he takes pleasure in killing slave owners? Like, obviously not. It's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Or like watching Inglorious Bastards or something, right? I, not to use two Tarantino movies, but you know, when, when the character is going on a killing rampage, but who they're killing are people who have done horrible, horrible things. We obviously know that it's not the same as the people doing those horrible things yeah. in the first place. And so like when you look back, like in season one, she takes pleasure in seeing her brother die. She kills uh, the witch who killed her husband, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we, or well, not killed, but basically like made him brain dead. Uh, you know, everyone she kills throughout the entire series run, even though she takes like a certain sick pleasure in it, they're bad people, objectively bad people who have done horrible things and we have seen like when she gives people second chances, she can get spurned, but like she's not just super rash and cruel. And we see time and again that demonstrated. I mean, she puts off her whole quest for the Iron Throne until things are secure in Slaver's Bay. Yeah. She even talks about it several times. Like, I can't leave yet because as soon as I leave, you know, then things will just fall back into disarray and the slave owners will take control again. And so she is more than willing 
to sacrifice her desire for the throne to get the job done to help the people. She does that over and over again, and it's why Tyrion supports her. It's why Varys supports her. It's why the Unsullied stay with her. It's why the, you know, Dothraki, well, I guess the Dothraki stay with her because she's super powerful. But, you know, most of the people in her circle are there supporting her with full loyalty because of her goodness, because of her mercy. You know, and if we think back to certain scenes like the famous Misa scene where, you know, they're all like holding her up and chanting, Misa, like we see that she cares about people. She cares very much so about people. And we see that literally up until just two episodes ago, she's laying everything on the line to protect Winterfell and the people of the North from the White Walkers and the Army of the Dead. She's putting like her dragons on the line, even though she knows like one of them was just killed last season by the Night King. Yeah. She's risking her dragons. She's risking her own life. She's risking the life of all of her people to do the right thing. And then for like 90 minutes later, she's just slaughtering a bunch of innocent people. It's just, it's so beyond ridiculous to say that that's earned. It, from a logic, especially if you look at just from a logical perspective, I think it's, it, it is more jarring just like, just because I sort of saw something similar coming, like very, like, like I always saw it coming from season seven or season six, like you know, they're sort of setting her up. Like, but that's sort of what made her interesting as well. Like she had, mm -hmm. as you say, she had this good side. Uh, yeah. that would make her actually a good ruler as well. But then she also has, you know, she has that uh, that background of abuse and she she's also, you know, the, the prog of incest from a family that, that have been crazy in the past. And mm -hmm. so she has that darker side and sometimes she, she shows that a little bit in the earlier seasons and shows she's a little bit sort of going one way and then the other way. And then now in season eight, it's like, you know, it's like you say, it's a couple of minutes of screen time almost and it's like, whoop. She goes like all the fucking well, you remember back in, uh, I think it was season four when she locks up her dragons? Yeah. Do you remember? Like she does that because one child, one child was right. killed yeah. when her dragon was like going out to eat. And she felt so fucking terrible and so fucking guilty about it that she locked her children in a crypt for like the entire season. It broke her heart to do it, but she was just like, I can't let these things fly around if they're going to kill children. And then here she is massacring a million people. Like they've said several times that a million people live in King's Landing and she's burning the entire city to the ground. After they've surrendered, she's won. All she has to do is take out Cersei and the throne is hers. Mm -hmm. She got, she won. Like there's, there's no loyalty that these people have to Cersei. They're terrified of her. They hate her. Yeah. You know? And so it's just, it's so unbelievable and lazy because there are ways you could have set that up for her to go on that murdering spree that would feel less illogical for her character. Um, like all it would take is to show this, the, you know, the people not accepting her or if like some of the people started like chucking spears at her or something like if they at all threatened her or just seemed unaccepting, like she already had all this paranoia all they had to do was structure it in a way that that paranoia got ramped up, but they were laying down their swords. Everyone was ringing the bells and just shouting for it to be over. And when it was over, that's when she decides to kill yeah, everybody. I, I it's like, there's gonna, no reason. Yeah, no, I agree. And I thought she was just going to go in and, and kill Cersei when she, she had the same, she got angry. It's like, Oh, she's going to kill Cersei now. And that's it. And then she just starts killing everyone. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I yeah. know you're, you're pissed off, but, but I don't understand. Like this is just like, there's too much of a gap there, you know? And I think the best, okay. I have the perfect allegory for this. This is what they did to Danny is like, they, they Anakin Skywalker her. It's mm -hmm. like, and literally the episode plays like, 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 it's almost as if Palpatine is coming up to the <laughs> Like, did I ever tell you the story of Darth Plagueis the Wise? Dude, yeah. And then everyone is just starts like going crazy and kills everyone. You know, it's, it's almost as if the youngling, younglings are coming like, oh, uh, uh, Danny, what, what are we going to do? We're all getting killed. And she's like, Dracarys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I will say this was actually, I think, like the highlight of the episode. And it's part of what's so disappointing is that 
in better hands, this would have been such a powerful moment. Yeah. Um, but like, cause basically I loved the moment when all the Northmen and the Unsullied just get bloodthirsty and start killing people. Because one, as we know from history, that's pretty much mm -hmm. always what happens in war, no matter what side you're on. There's no good guys or bad guys. Like the beast comes out of men once the blood starts flowing and they will start raping and pillaging and killing innocent people. Like the violence just takes over and there's this, this fervor and you can hear people talk about it in historical texts about like people who've survived these battles and, you know, bared witness to this sort of thing. And the, the notion that like, here's their leader, their queen going off on this rampage, it gives them permission right, to do whatever they the want. Yeah. It's so, and it, makes, so it makes logical sense, you know, like that, okay, to see Danny Dugan and then to see Grey Worm, who's the leader of the Unsullied yeah. the guy who starts the, the fighting on the ground. And so that, that makes sense logically. So I don't think that's like a stretch of the imagination. I think that's exactly what would happen. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just like how they, they get there to build up to it. Yeah. And I think that's another thing we need to talk about is the, the narrative consistency, because that's, mm -hmm. it's not just that they didn't have enough time, which, which was the case. And it's like, it, it, it's like, that's a, a problem of their own making because they decided to go uh, with six, uh, well, no, eight seasons, but then the, the last two, the, this season and the mm -hmm. one before was shortened as well. Whereas HBO, I, I heard this somewhere is that they wanted to go 10 seasons. So I don't know if this is true, but uh, I should look it up to fact check. Well, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, regardless of how many seasons they were like hoping to get, you know for certain that HBO would have kept it going forever. HBO is a business, and any successful business wants to keep their successful product going. I mean, sure. the, the Walking Dead's been renewed for what, like 14 seasons or something? I mean, like shows, like look at Supernatural. How long has that been on? The Simpsons, like shows that have gone to shit, but because people still watch them, people still you know, support them and they still get their ad revenue, uh, you know, from running these big commercials. Uh, like there's still a profit to be made. If you look at the ratings of Game of Thrones, they steadily climbed each season and they just blasted. They went, it went from something like six and a half to seven million average viewers throughout season six to over 10 million average viewers Oof. for every episode of season seven. Like right. a huge increase from season seven. And this season so far, has had somewhere near 12 million average viewers per episode. So it's not an issue of HBO wanting to cancel the show. Like they would have zero reason to want to cancel it. And especially yeah. considering they're launching, I've heard five spinoff series. Um, like yeah. there's, they want to make money. No, it's, so it had to be D and D. The, it had to be. The, that was why they ended it. And I think it's because they knew they couldn't possibly fill out the final story with the same finesse that George did. So instead of trying to arbitrarily stretch it and adding their own, you know, flavor, they just decided to cap it all off and just like rush to the ending. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. And besides that, I, I, I truly think that they're just done with it. I think, yeah, I think too. Been some quote by, by either Dan or Dave in season five, even back to season five, where they're like, where they, I don't, I, there's a quote, I know there's a quote where it's like that they're sort of tired, but that, it's mm -hmm. very, that it's very demanding. And I, I mean, like, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. But like, for me, it's like, then why didn't they Pass just- Pass the torch. Yeah, yeah. That's what I don't know. And just be like sort of on the sideline as a producer to sort of guide so that the story doesn't feel completely different all of a sudden. Uh, well, whatever. Hell, even George backed out. He was, uh, for the first four seasons, I think, maybe- uh, in the fifth season as well he wrote an episode per season yeah and yeah. he was kind of there like guiding things and had a much more active presence in the show mm -hmm. but he was like i just can't like this is taking too much time i need to focus on the books that's what the fans are screaming about they'd rather me finish the books than help the show so right. even he left like i feel like if they were getting burned out or like the thing that i keep seeing in the comments is uh, that they're working on a Star Wars trilogy. And so they were just trying to wrap yeah, up Game yeah, of Thrones yeah. so they could get moving on to that. And it's like, if that's the case, then don't be so selfish and possessive. Like this, do this show doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to the fans, just like any creation. Like once you put something out there into the world, it does not belong to you anymore. It belongs right. to the readers. It belongs to the viewers. Fucking do not sabotage. Because, okay, so maybe you're fatigued. Maybe you're tired for now. But this show is going to last forever. And this is what we're going to be stuck with forever. This is the final season. They're not going to go back and reshoot it just because people aren't happy with it. That's it. It's over. Like mm -hmm. we have one episode left and there's no, like, come on, 
we already know how it's going to end. Like, let's be real. Um, or at least like what they're clearly setting up and then probably throwing a big yeah. twist in the gears yeah. just last minute. Well, I mean, and, and this is what we're, what, what we get, you know, it's, 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 it's exactly, it's like those moments are just like the last two seasons. It's most, especially this season is just like the, the final couple of like major beats without the story mm-hmm. surrounding and the buildup surrounding, or like at least the buildup that we have is very flawed just because they don't have the time to properly show it as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's just purely to get, just trying to mask that, I think, with the for, for getting those moments with maximum maximum shock for like the more I guess the more casual viewers to sort of mask that this sure. actually doesn't really is not very coherent uh, what's happening. And so you know, and, and we see it in this episode as well. Uh, to go back to 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 Danny as well when when the attack starts and you see the entire Iron Fleet and they have all the scorpions and you know from last episode I was like how mm-hmm. how are they going to to win at this point like I don't know if they're going to win and that's good you know you want to sort of set those stakes up but like sure. the way they set it up was like very very unbelievable like just like they had to write it that way so when she loses her dragon th- the way that happened was ridiculous in my opinion in the sense yeah. that you know they have these these laser guided uh, ballistics <laughs> just shoot regular and the way just like these hit scan <laughs> as well. aimbot, you like, know okay. Yeah, and then she char- and then she dies down. I'm like, okay, she's going to die because there's 30 ballistas aimed at her, and and she's going in a straight line. Drogon mm-hmm. is a bigger dragon; he's closer. She's dead. You know, that's it. And then she miss- they miss everything. I'm like, okay, this is this doesn't make any sense at all. And like, I'm really pissed about that. But then I'm like, they go to King's Landing then to to discuss the release of the Sunday, which the whole the whole thing that they even went there was insane to me because they, yeah, I don't understand why they weren't co- killed, but whatever. Uh, but then she has like what like twenty unsullied left, and now this episode, all this oh man, <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm like, I know John had the other half. Fine, there's still I know there's some unsullied left. Fair enough, but but then I the rewatched well the long night so closely while editing my video on it. Yeah. I have like studied frames of that, and at several different parts of the episode, you can see it like the remnants of the battlefield of the battle of Winterfell. Yeah. And there's like 20 of them left. I know, you know, yeah. unless they all somehow just like found invisibility cloaks or something. Like when there's that final zoom out after the army of the dead falls, you can see there's like barely anybody left alive. And then they're right. even showing in the next episode, the big funeral pyre of like, just look at how many people died. And then all of a sudden she's like replenished back to full force. It's yeah. just, it's ridiculous. Like where did they come from? That's it's, yeah, and so it makes inconsistent. The, yeah. And it makes all the deaths also just pointless. Like everything is pointless mm-hmm. because nothing means anything. No, exactly. Like, it's exactly. just like if the writer wants to come back, it's fine. You know, like, and that's why, this whole thing felt so anticlimactic as well because like nothing matters. So why should I know so, it's the same thing that like the walking dead did that people were complaining about with like Negan, like yeah. no matter how many times they stormed into any of his different strongholds and no matter how many of the saviors they wiped out next episode, they always had like 300 more with grenade launchers and machine guns. Right. And it's just like, what the fuck? Like, no, yeah. are these like gremlins that are just spawning in the middle of the night? Like, this is so <laughs> stupid. Yeah. Have you watched the, the preview for the next episode? Yes. And, and, oh. oh yeah. Sure. Her fo- she has more than ever. Yeah. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> that final shot of her like walking down the stairs, you see like, I don't even know how many unsullied. And it's like, what? Where do they keep coming from? Yeah. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm getting heated, and I'm trying. I'm trying to I'm yeah, trying to yeah. keep let's, calm, let's but it's on. like D- uh, dial down just a little bit. Uh, yeah. so it's hard. I- it's hard as a fan of the show. <laughs> it's it's uh, and yeah, I mean, like I've been a fan since the beginning as well, so it's definitely mm-hmm. tough. But in, and 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 I mean, uh, just to finish up this point about the narrative consistency, just with the, mm-hmm. the rules of the world, I guess. And yeah. So we got to see the basically how dangerous these scorpions. Uh, can yeah. be. and so even if you even if you sort of forget that they really don't have much of an army and then all of a sudden they do this episode uh but then you're like okay well there's still the scorpions and danny is going at them alone like without any yeah. cover and so some people have been saying oh it's the sun covering so okay fair enough that's that's a good strategy but still there's hundreds of them in the city yeah. there's ne- we've never seen so many so many of these scorpions these up- upgraded ones i guess uh mm-hmm. together in one place and like only like one or two of them actually shoot they miss and yeah. all of them just sort of stand there and die and 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 at that point i was like you know i'm like okay this doesn't matter and i saw um lars send me send me uh 
an image or, or someone saying like, what if Rhaegal just survived the last episode and he was shot down this episode and that sort of led to Danny going crazy. Uh, that alone would have made this whole thing mm-hmm. more believable, I would say, because then she's in like this, she's more impulsive, I guess, in the sense that she feels that emotion. But uh, we don't get any of that, you know, and it's, no. uh, it's just, it seems like a simple thing to do. And then it would have solved a lot of problems. I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of simple stuff like that this whole season. And that's part of what makes it so frustrating is yeah. that like fans are coming up with better solutions to these problems than the guys who are paid millions of dollars to write it. Right. You know, because like another thing that just like specifically with the, the ballistas is like so many of the shots that they intercut of her destroying them. They're not even firing. They're literally just standing next yeah, yeah. to it and then getting incinerated. It's like, no one's going to do that in a battle. Like these are people because when you watch the inside the episode, they talk about how they wanted to have this ground floor perspective of all the destruction going on mm-hmm. because these are all human beings. And we forget that sometimes because we don't, these aren't named characters who we know all about. Like these aren't our heroes, but they still matter. They're still people. That's what Varys has been saying. You know, this whole season is like, it's the realm. They're all people and they deserve to live just as much as you and I and et cetera, et cetera. So like, they're not going to just stand there and let a dragon incinerate them. They're going to fight to the death. And we literally, there's like 10 different shots of her during her strafing run where they're not even aiming at her. They're not even trying. They're just standing there to die. And it's just, and then like the stealth dragon shit was infuriating. Like the moment when like the, the golden company is just standing in front of the gates (laughs) and the the dragon is like a hundred feet behind them. And they're just like, what's that? I hear some noises in the background and then the wall gets like blown to shit. It's like, you would hear that. Like they keep filming stuff in a way that gives a good visual shock. But like I said in my video, they're like the equivalent of bad jump scares. Right. It's like once you break down the logic of the presentation of the scene, it doesn't make any sense Mm -hmm. because here we have the setup uh, which is like the full Dunkirk moment of the dragon flying in. And we hear the sound of, you know, like a plane flying at them. But you know, and when it's, I mean, what, like a thousand feet away, but we can't hear it when it's literally right behind them blowing out the wall until the moment the wall gets blown out. It's just like, there's no consistency with the logic of how any of the information is presented. No. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. And then, not, to, not even to mention that the Golden Company, you know, didn't really do anything at all. They just, they died. 20,000 men, apparently. And, and see, I'm not even, I'm not even bothered by that because, I mean, that's the whole thing. The dragons can I know, I know, incinerate but everything in sight. I, yeah. It's just but, the whole, <laughs> the whole way it all together. That's just like, yeah. I think if they could have told that well, and that, that sort of would have, like, I would have been fine with that if everything else had been told in a consistent manner. Then I'd be like, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I know well like we established that Euron and his fleet can see the dragons from behind a cliff but apparently this whole army is just completely oblivious to the fact that there's a dragon incinerating the city right behind them right because they're all just standing there like waiting for the battle like you know just twiddling their thumbs and then it's like oh no there's a dragon like yeah you knew that you knew that (laughs) I and well, a bunch of they had a bunch of archers lined up on the walls. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a shot of them like going up on the wall, and I don't see, and I don't think, I don't think no. I saw any of them even present in the shots or like firing at all. Like you would think that that no. would at least be a danger to to uh, Danny. But I guess I know the whole episode is about her and her descent into to madness and and basically uh, burning down a defeated uh, enemy. That's the whole point. I get it. I get it. But it needs, you know, it's not they need to make it at least a little bit believable in, in the way they present it. But I, I guess we, this can, we sort of wrap this up so we can go on to talk about uh, Jamie and I guess John for a little bit and Arya, I guess. Well, and Cersei for that matter. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, cause one of the biggest things that I've had a, an issue with since like really, really thinking about this episode is we have seen countless times that Cersei always has a backup plan. She's always got something figured out. And like, she literally just stands and watches the city fall with no strategy whatsoever. Well, her, her, plan, was, her plan was to, that, that they would stick to consistent writing. And, and she was, <laughs> I was like, ah, she's probably pretty good, at least better than, than it ended up being, at least a little bit better, you know? So she, I guess she was as surprised as, as we were. <laughs> that <she> yeah. Was. <laughs> they just made her so helpless at the end when she has bested a lot of other foes. And frankly, she's way better at playing the game than Danny ever was yeah, yeah, yeah. or it was ever going to be like she's been in the thick of it since the very beginning like 
orchestrating a lot of the most gnarly shit that's gone down on the show. Yeah. And like, you know, for her to just be so unprepared for what's happening just doesn't feel right at all for the character. No, and it's it's all done. The way the reason why it is is because it's all done in service of that sort of sub, well, I guess if you I call it a subversion of Danny having becoming sort of the Mad Queen. It's all in service of that because it's all her episode. It's not, and so her arc, Cersei's arc, sort of uh, has to suffer under that, uh, along with all basically all the other arcs as well. Um, and so that, that's I guess that's how we get to to Jamie as well because I think mm -hmm. most people, including myself, and I don't know if I speak for you as well, is that when Jamie left Brienne last episode and he said that he that he's hateful and Cersei's hateful and he's going back to her and, and he's telling her all the terrible things that he's done. I thought that he was going to go back to King's Landing to kill Cersei and that that whole thing was just a ploy to to make Brienne sort of accept him leaving her because he he mm. was trying to present present himself as a douche. I didn't think he would do. A 180 on his oh no i fully based on everything else that had happened in the battle of winterfell as soon as that happened i knew what they were doing and really i would i didn't even like necessarily consider the implications until this episode and it really really bothered me because uh, yeah, i mean it completely undid his entire character arc it did and for the second well i mean like they made him sort of he was bad in the beginning and then he sort of became good when he was br with Brienne, and then he was bad again. And then last season, it seemed like they were finally done with that because Cersei actually is trying to kill him. <laughs> and he's finally seeing how crazy she's become. And now in like the blink of a, se of a second, he's like, no, actually, I'm going to go back. Uh, and, and, well, and, right. And, and just, I mean, it was, I thought it was a complete um, disservice to his character, and it makes his entire arc completely pointless. Well, because literally what happens is, you know, like he's in love with Cersei and he does a lot of horrible shit to protect her and to protect their love. You know, he pushes Bran out the window, like he kills people. He does whatever he has to do yeah. to get back to Cersei. But there's always underpinning that in honorable men. And we know that because his like nickname, his namesake, Kingslayer, really cuts at him because his whole thing is like, fuck you guys. He was the mad king. Like, yeah, I'm the king's guard who killed his own king but he was going to burn the city to the ground. Like mm -hmm. what, what should I do? Keep my oath or let every fucking person die, including the people who are now talking shit about him to his face and behind his back. Like I could have let you die, you assholes, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And like, there's that scene in season three when he's in the bath with Brienne and he's telling her this um, because she's like giving him shit about like having no honor and whatever. And he's like, no, like, this is why I killed him. He wanted me to kill my dad and bring him his fucking severed head. And he wanted me to like sit by as he lit all of the stores of wildfire under the city and killed everyone in the city. And what would you do? And he's like getting really emotional recounting the story. Like, what would you do if your king asked you to do the same thing? Would you just stand by and let thousands of innocent people die? No, like, you would do something about it. That was the honorable thing to do in that moment, you know? And so we see this subversion of the, what we thought Jamie was from like early season one. And as we go throughout seasons two, three, four, we see that he's a much better person than that. Yes, he still loves Cersei, but like that starts to change uh, because in like season six, after she destroys the Sept of Baelor and just takes the throne, like you can see that fear when he's watching her coronation, he's like, who is this woman? You know, like, this is not okay. And then the final straw for him is when she's playing a political game with the apocalypse. He's like trying to convince her to go north to join the fight. And he thinks originally that that's what she's going to do. But then, you know, she confesses like, oh, actually, I'm just going to let this play out and then pick up the scraps, you know, so we can save ourselves. And he, that's his final straw. And he leaves her. He leaves her in her time of need when it's just the two of them against the world. Basically, they have like every army against them and whatever. And he's like, no, like, we're done. I mean, I can't stand by you anymore. And so for him, after the battle, after seeing like, like she's just been sitting cozy in the castle, letting everyone die. And they almost lost that battle. And it would have been like the end of the world as they knew it. If they lost the dragons, if they lost all of those like big armies, they would have been fucked. Westeros would have been completely overrun. And he knows this. So for him after that to go and, nah, no, nah, I'm going to go back to Cersei. It's like, wh what? 
And then for him to have that line of like, I never much cared for the people innocent or otherwise like bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. You showed us in the show. Like it's just going against what they've already established as Canon. And that's why it's frustrating. It's not just like, Oh, you didn't like what happened. It's no, like you're lying to us. You changed what the history of this show is. You just changed these characters at the last minute to get them where you wanted to. So they could have their beautiful poetic ending dying in each other's arms. And it's like, it just doesn't make any sense. It's not, they had the moment. They just, they just didn't know or didn't care for how to get there. It's just like, mm-hmm. okay, they need to die in each other's arms. Uh, even though it does, at this point, it wouldn't make any sense narratively without breaking the narrative, or at least his arc, right. to get there. And so, yeah, this is what we end up with. And, and I, I mean, I, was, I truly thought that he was going to, to kill her. That was what I, that mean. Like, I think, and, I, and I've seen a lot of comments that people talk about as well. And everyone's like, oh, you know, he's just saying this. Because nobody, like everyone was like, okay, he's not going to go back. That wouldn't make any sense for him to suddenly go back to her uh, Mm -hmm. again at this point in the story. But it's because if you listen to, if you watch the behind the scenes stuff with uh, Dan and and David, I mean, the way they talk about this stuff, it's just, it's always the same sort of mentality of like, we know this needs to happen. Yeah. So like the hound, like we know he needed to die by fire. So we're going to put him in a situation where that's going to happen. Or we know that it can't be John who kills the night King because it just doesn't feel right. So we just know. And like, they just, it, they follow this like bullshit instinct based on surprising people more than like what the story is telling, you know? Yeah, that's, that's exactly. And, and, uh, talking about the hound he's Mm -hmm. technically the only character who this episode is crucial another crucial episode which actually got some sort of resolution even though i think the way they did it wasn't even that good but uh whatever at least he was the only character who did get his uh his resolution to his story but even with him i felt like at this point what happened to his character and then the the ultimate fight were both kind of lackluster i didn't really I, n- I never felt like he was always looking for that revenge at this point. No, I, I know. Past that a little bit. So I was kind of weird. I looked, this would have always been, and, and, and I'm just going to basically commit suicide now. So I felt, I don't know. I, I get what, what they were trying to do because they're intercutting it with, uh, with Arya, which mm-hmm. is the crowd. And so, you know, Arya has always looked at him as a sort of mentor type. And, and it's established that they're in episode two, that they're both basically killers now when she goes mm-hmm. and sort of hangs out with him on, on the wall. Uh, Winterfell and 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 so now what they're trying to do I I think is that Arya sort of having her redemption arc where she's moving now moving away from being this cold-hearted assassin right to maybe you know um, actually having sort of a redemptive arc towards the light so to say and so that's intercut with um, with the Hound having this final battle and committing suicide and this final act for revenge, whereas Arya has also been about revenge, but now when she has this final chance to get her revenge on Cersei, she eventually ultimately decides not to do it. And so, see, even that felt cheap to me too. I don't know because so it was I, just I, like this hallmark conversation of like, "Oh, don't become me," and she's like, "Oh, cool." Like <laughs> again, yeah, that's exactly it. It's like okay, I can see this. I, I can imagine something like this again happening in the books where she, it seems like people have been commenting this as well on my, on my video is that it's Arya is not in the books. Well, that's what people think. It's like, she's all about like this little girl who gets traumatized by the things that happen around mm-hmm. her and her family's dying. And she, her, the way of coping with that is she goes into, she becomes this assassin and she, she it's all about revenge. Her entire purpose in life is now about getting revenge and that that ultimately isn't something that will, you know, that, that she can live with in the end. Like she, she just becomes less and less human. And in the end, she has to um, do something more selfless uh, for other people to, to sort of come back, maybe have that arc or like the, the potential of going that direction. So it seems like the show is now doing that as well. Uh, and, but again, it's like what you said, it didn't feel earned or it didn't feel that powerful just because it's so rushed. It's like all of a sudden we have this moment and uh, neither of these pay off that well. And uh, I think that's how we get to, to, to Arya and her story in, in, in this episode, which I think mainly is that she has insane amount of plot armor again. Mm. So it's, it's, uh, I think she dies like 10 times this episode. There's one. Oh my God, it's ridiculous. Like, do you know that moment when at the very end, when she's running with the, 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 the lady who saved her and then. Yeah, and then she water. just turns the corner and somehow yeah. doesn't like get. And then, yeah, and then the fire, shit. you see the fire coming around the corner. And I was like, yeah. I, I told my girlfriend, oh, she's dead. But I knew, okay, she's definitely not dead, but she, she is dead. She should be dead. 
and then right. miraculously see everyone is dead around her, but she she survived. Like we thought Sam had plot armor at the Battle of Winterfell, but this no, was just ridiculous. No, was like crazy. she's like the sole surviving member of King's Landing. I mean, everyone else that was near her at every turn was getting incinerated. She was literally just there to provide a POV for the audience. That's all yeah. it was. And they just cheated the logic of the situation to make it happen. Because literally, buildings are falling down around her. Fire is everywhere. Everywhere people are getting obliterated, crushed, stabbed. Like, there's just zero chance that she'd be able to survive that the way they present it. You know, like, if we saw her, like, going down into the crypts even, like, that would be... I mean, fuck, like, clearly that wouldn't work because that's how Jamie and Cersei got killed. It's like, it just makes no, no sense at all to see her survive that. This is why there's, at least to me, there's really not much of suspense or anything because I feel like no. it doesn't, nothing matters, you know? It's all, it's all just spectacle for, for spectacle's sake and there's no consequences yeah. to actions at no. all. Like, only when, when the writers want there to be consequences. No, and even when there are consequences, I just don't care anymore. No, like, yeah. Like, I, yeah. I remember in season four, when Brienne confronts Arya and the Hound, like that was such a fucking amazing moment. Cause those are like where the best moments come when it's like, you're rooting kind of on both sides. Like that's what made Blackwater so great. Yeah. Cause you like Stannis and Davos and you like Tyrion and you know, you're kind of already starting to like the Hound. You know, if any one of you dies with a, a clean sword, I'll fuck your corpse. Like, <laughs> or whatever, like, you know, they're like, you're already liking the characters on both sides. And so it's this, this super, tense moment like Brienne and the Hound oh my god who's gonna win and you don't want either of them to lose and when the Hound loses it's like oh it was heartbreaking and I got so emotional but like here I am watching this Jamie having been one of my favorite characters for the last four seasons now and I didn't even like get remotely emotional when he died I just didn't care at no, all because no. because him being there made no sense to me because yeah. honestly it's like then what was the fucking point of him getting with Brienne in the first place just to subvert people again like that's and to make brienne seem like a weak bitch like you know what i mean dude if you like, think about it yeah yeah i mean but if you think about it if you even when you go back to season seven to have this whole story arc where they have to you know prove to to the other people in king's landing that the army of the dead is real and it's an important part and it's like oh this is really important right and so the only and they have to go beyond the wall and a bunch of people get killed and then they mm -hmm. finally have this convoluted plan and and the only thing that this really leads up to is that the only thing that happens because of that is that Jamie goes north to mm -hmm. have sex with Brienne and then he goes back. That's the only consequence that yeah. that whole thing had. Like nothing else mm -hmm. happened because of that. <laughs> so like, uh, it's just, again, this is like all these things that are happening this season that, that don't make sense now also make the, the things that happened before uh, not matter. You know, they don't matter anymore. They've been mishandling every character. Yeah. And I think it's now time to talk about John because yeah. I think one of, so part of the reason I was just kind of like resigned to hate this episode pretty early on in it. Cause keep, keep in mind, I love this show. Like this was my favorite show forever and ever and ever. I wanted to love this season. I was so hyped all these two years waiting. Cause I didn't even hate season seven. Like when everyone else was backing on it, I was like, no, like it's still, it's building though. It's going to be good. Trust me. And uh, one of the things that happened early on was with the whole Varys thing. Like I believe Daenerys would do that in that moment. I don't agree with it, but I get where she's coming from, from her character's perspective. I don't think her killing basically a traitor, you know, is really all that out of character for her. What felt really out of character for me was like Tyrion and Jon just being totally fine with it. Like, Oh, he just knows this secret. Uh, he's not like trying to hurt her. He's not, you know, necessarily like that as far as they know, it's just, well, he's trying to put the truth out there and they're just totally fine with him getting incinerated. And yeah. well, when we yeah. see her like so, so stupidly rushed, like all of her soldiers were just, like half of her army was just taken out. They're all battle weary. And she's like, nope, we're marching. We're going to war right now. And John's like, yeah, sure. Like he's, he's never been, I mean, if we go back and we look at his relationship with Egret, he betrayed her to do the right thing, you know, and it broke his heart to do it. But it's like, I can't like you're I have to protect the people. I have to protect the Night's Watch. And like, you know, if that means we can't be together, then so be it. And like, it's heartbreaking the way that ends up playing out. But here he is standing by Danny no matter what. Why? 
that's not John. Like he's the most honorable character on the show since Ned. And here he is just like, no, she's my queen. I, I, I love her. Oh, she, like, I honestly don't even know how the fuck they're going to handle this next episode. Like, is, know, he, yeah. is he going to defend her? If so, I'm going to just like delete HBO from my life forever because like, what? <laughs> but I'm fully, I'm honestly fully expecting there to be a moment next episode where Arya is obviously going to kill or try to kill Danny. I don't think she's going to, cause we'd expect that since she killed the night King. So they're going to have to subvert expectations by killing her or something. But I fully anticipate there being a moment where like John stands in the way, like, Oh no, she'll still be a good queen. Like, like how he's able to defend her actions is just so unbelievable. Yeah. And we're not even talking about the fact that he's become uh, basically throughout the season, except for maybe the first episode, he's become a completely passive character. Yes. Uh, he, because of this exact reason, he's like, he's only been saying like, Oh no, it's my queen. Like that line has basically been said like in variations of it for like the last two episodes, I think. And, mm-hmm. and he isn't doing anything else. He doesn't even, he didn't even have many lines this episode either. Uh, no. But, I don't know. I, I'm hoping they'll do something with him in the, in the finale. I'm sure they will. But uh, he's been very lackluster in, in, in this season, especially. Uh, and it's very sad to see because, it, the, and that's what I said in my video. Like, I think they really took away his big moment was with the Night King and they didn't mm-hmm. give it to him enough, at least to me, uh, sure. for it to be satisfying. And so now it's like they took away that momentum. They took away that climax. And now it's like, yeah. What is John supposed to do? You know, he's like, was, that's like the last thing to sort of sort out is then with Daenerys. But it seems like it will be Arya. Well, we don't know if this will be Arya. You, you, you're right. Like they might subvert that again. Um, so I guess we'll have to see how that plays in, and then we can we can bring our conclusions to to that as well. For me, it's this is all again a show of like how they're so focused on getting these these last couple of moments, and they don't really care how to get there. It's all about like these. these the subverting of expectations and just to get those short shock moments and a larger narrative, mm-hmm. you know, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. And it's like, to me, it's like, I really don't care if we end up with something that, that is sort of expect, like all the other subversions that happened before were had build up to it and had foreshadowing to it. And, and even though I didn't even see some of them coming, if you, if you watch them again, you're like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. that This actually happened. Or they had logical consequences or like the, the things that happened had logical consequences. Uh, for them happening and so mm-hmm. everything sort of makes narrative sense and i don't really care for like they're all about no it needs to be surprising otherwise it's not good but that's not true like the lord of the rings is right. not a, a, a very surprising story like there's some things that are kind of surprising that happen that you might not expect to happen when you watch it for the first time but sure. ultimately it doesn't matter like i keep going back to that story just because it is an emotionally narratively satisfying story that managed to to you know uh makes me it makes me feel uh, something when i watch it you know it's 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 engaging yeah. and so sure it doesn't have the, the the shock surprises that 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 game of thrones has for the most part uh, at least I'm, I'm talking about the like the the, the this season and the last season I mean, no sure 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 um, well one thing i think is interesting is hearing uh george martin talk about how much he loves the scourge of the shire um or the scouring of the shire uh it's a it's the penultimate chapter of the Lord of the Rings. It's not in any of the adaptations. It's not in like Peter Jackson's movies, but uh, like, I think that that sums up a lot about how we can expect George's ending to go. And maybe even this series ending uh, for the show, because like he obviously gave them notes about like the bigger strokes. And I do think that some of the stuff they've done are a part of that, like Danny going mad, the destruction of King's Landing. Like I can totally see a lot of that stuff. Sure. Um, because the the way it seems his ending has been kind of planned for a long time is that yes the good guys win but at great cost so like the the scouring of the shire is like uh sam mary uh pippin and frodo go back to hobbiton and it's like overrun by thugs and um th- they end up having like a, a battle it's the last battle of the great war and it turns out that Saruman has disguised himself as one of the Saxville Bagginses and he's like being helped by Green Wormtongue and he's like corrupting a uh, Hobbiton and you know so they have to fight this like big final battle and it's this like really sad moment though and part of why they cut it out of most of the adaptations and why a lot of fans of the books hate that chapter is because it's like they won and here they want to go back home but it's not home anymore like it's destroyed and you know like burning and you know a lot of people are dead and 
it's just like that's that says a lot to me about what martin has intended uh, is that like war has consequences and war is ugly and it reaches everywhere and it's not just something that like oh the good guys won the bad guys are defeated now we'll enter this peaceful prosperous reign and i don't think that's what he's ever intended for the show i think it's always meant to kind of get dark and sad at the end and i think that that's like a beautiful thing to be building simultaneously john and danny who are like you talk about in your video both like really really great uh king archetypes for a long time but then we slowly start weaving in the idea that danny has this darker side and I love the idea of like it comes to an end in this way where, you know, she does turn evil uh, and all the Northmen and the Unsullied are raping and pillaging just like the Lannister armies did. And like, we thought they were better than that, but they're not. And, you know, to see it come to an end in such a way that yes, ultimately evil quote unquote is defeated, but at what cost? And like, now what are the repercussions for the world moving forward? But the problem is like, you know, they just didn't earn any of these big emotional beats and you know to shove it into such a tight squeeze has caused them to make a lot of sacrifices with who these characters are and who we've come to know them as because i mean john has been just basically a completely fucking pointless character for the last two seasons like all last season his only line in the entire fucking show every episode is it doesn't matter we have to fight the army of the dead like every scene every interaction he has with fucking anyone is just harping on that and now this season it's oh she's my queen i don't want the throne it's like like the all of the writing this season has literally been people just completely transparently canvassing their emotions which is just not what thrones is about like you know, like just people being very blunt about what they're fucking thinking, or it's been just like, "Ooh, look, we remember stuff that happened once upon a time." Yeah, yeah. Just- Don't you worry. Like, there's so many random callbacks to earlier episodes that, like, in another context, would feel great in the final season, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it just feels like they're d- dividing their time in such a weird way. Like, I was talking about this with my brother the other day. That like, here they are pressed for time, but like they spend 25, 30 minutes of uh, episode four just like watching the characters play drinking games. Like if you're fucking in such a rush, you know, (laughs) maybe don't spend all your time with dick jokes and, you know, like, I don't know. It's it's like the most disappointing thing to me. Right. Because they they wrote so many of the episodes of the show, uh, Dan and and David, and I think they did a tremendous job of adapting the show. Like they, they really seem to have a good grasp on what was important in the show um and having read like most of the books uh like they really kept faithfully to it for the most part there were small changes here and there um some like kind of big changes but nothing that feels like it's totally abandoning the major themes of the show Mm -hmm. or the character arcs (coughs) but then they just undid everything in this last season like yeah. literally everything. So, and this is, and I, I fear that after this last episode, so I won't judge until we've seen all of it, I guess. But um, I fear that that this whole season will be the how I met your mother of of the of, of Game of Thrones. Really, that mm-hmm. that final moments will make the rest of even though you know the first four seasons are excellent. Yeah, sure, they'll still be excellent in the sense in the in the presentation and the acting and all of that. But the narrative as a whole will be diminished to such an extent that I don't think that that a lot of people who are not liking it right now will be able to rewatch it and, and find I much agree. value there because you know the character a lot of these character arcs were at least for the characters who are still alive now and who are in those earlier seasons as well it, they're pretty pointless you know they don't mean anything anymore most mm-hmm. of them and maybe some of them will with this wrap up I don't know but I doubt it um, so I I think I mean we've been going for for, for quite some time I think that's Sort of the note that the, the the pressing note that we have to end this on. Yeah. Uh, I think you know people have been asking both of us our updated th- thoughts, and I hope we sort of gave it here. And mm-hmm. I don't know, based on this next episode, we might both have to update with an actual video essay. We'll we'll have to see if there's enough there to to add on to with uh, yeah. just like uh, ranting or or just well, like, it's entirely possible. And because I think it's better to have like a cohesive form of thoughts and i think the added benefit of doing a video essay as opposed to you know like a podcast is to be able to show the clips and like really demonstrate uh because i think that was one of the things um that i was really happy with with my video was just like 
having that super cut of just how much they've built up the White Walkers to have them so anticlimactically taken out of the picture. So I, it's something I'm considering. I have been getting requests from people to to cover this episode. I've even already been checking the comments and it's like, oh, you thought this episode was bad. Wait till you watch episode five. Yeah. And so we'll see. I've I feel like I have already been so like heartbroken by this season. And people want to say, well then like don't watch it. It's like, I mean, come on. <laughs> been with it for eight years. I'm gonna follow it through even if I'm hating every minute of it. Mm-hmm. But We'll see. Uh, I have a lot of harsh opinions about this episode and uh, based on how they've set up the next episode, I can't imagine that that's going to make me feel any better about the season as a whole. Um, But yeah, I mean, what else can you say? (laughs) What else can you say? Yeah. Well, Hey, the good, the good thing is that I finally, I finally ordered the first book. So I'm yes. You know what you can say where you want Dan and Dave did push me to to actually, you know, start reading the real thing. <laughs> George will do if he ever finished it. He'll yeah. Do job at well, like I, I say in my video, I actually do think this will give him some motivation. Yeah. Because it, I th- and it's because it's interesting. Like I feel like no one's really mad about the grand narrative structure that's happening this season. Everyone's yeah. just mad about the execution of it. Right. That's like I haven't seen anyone like pissed that Danny turned to the bad guy it's like we all kind of thought that was a possibility um it's just they handled it so piss poorly so i think uh because i think he was getting pretty depressed i mean the whole reason he signed on to do the show when he did was because he firmly believed he thought he was going to have book six out by the time they were on like season two and then that would have given him plenty of time to do dream of spring before they ever caught up and he just got outpaced and it really you know put a damper on him like focusing on the books but so i think now all the fans crying out for our one true the prince that was promised george rr martin you know i think he'll i think he'll probably really start pushing for it and i certainly hope so because that's the whole reason i didn't finish the books uh because five are published and i read the first three in like less than a month i could not put them down they are so 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 good and all I could think was like, oh, God, I got to stop. I got to slow down because if I get to book five and then have to wait 10 fucking years, like I'm going to go crazy. So I can leave it here and I'll be OK because, yeah, but we'll see. Hopefully, I mean, he published Dance of Dragons in what, 2010, 2011. Um, hopefully we get wins in winter soon. Hopefully. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this. I heard that he actually was disappointed in this last episode. Um, so I'm going to look this up. I don't know if this is true, but I've heard uh, the, through the grapevine that, that he actually said that he was disappointed in, in how this episode went down. So we'll wow. see. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. So yeah. thanks, thanks for coming on, man. Um, yeah. I always appreciate talking to you. Um, yeah, man. So I will probably uh, do a, maybe another podcast after next episode, probably with Lars. Uh, and then maybe we'll get another video. We'll see. Anyways, thanks for for listening, guys. See you.